Hey everybody, it's Damien Gergia from The Breakdown Show and today's guest is Adrian Goldsworthy. Adrian is a British historian and novelist who specializes in Asian Roman history. Adrian attended Westbourne School in Penard. He then read Ancient and Modern History at St. John's College in Oxford, compiling a doctors in philosophy in Ancient Military History from the University of Oxford in 1994. That dissertation led to the foundation of his first book, The Roman Army at War 100 BC AD 200. Goldsworthy has written several historical works on ancient Rome, especially the Roman army, and nine novels. Hey, if you want to support the Breakdown Show, go to breakdownshow.com and subscribe. You can donate to the PayPal link, you can buy our merch, or you can simply watch our videos for free on YouTube. Also, don't forget to donate to our veteran tribe at savethebrave.org. All right, enough of me. Here comes Adrian Goldsworthy. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg this is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hello, I'm Adrian Goldsworthy, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show, with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, yes it is. Adrian Goldsworthy is a force of, of knowledge of the ancient world, in particular the Roman times, and I can't wait to talk to you. Uh, look, we're all fascinated by the Romans, and, and we spend a lot of time doing it. The main reason why you're here, let's hold the book up real fast here. <laughs> He's got this new book called The Fort. It's one of a series of books. Uh, listen, he writes a lot of fiction and he writes a lot of history. And so you're getting the benefit of a PhD historian who knows this time writing these uh, fiction books. And it's just a treat to read um, something like this. So thank you for sending me the book. Thank you for telling me the story. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, very happy to be invited. It's, um, you know, basically, I think like most authors, I write the sort of books I'd like to read. So you just hope that someone out there likes them as well, because it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a book that you'd like to be there. It isn't. So you've got to write it. So. Yeah. And, and we're, we're sort of, we're stuck with fiction because though we know a lot about a lot of different battles and everything, it's just, look, so I'm a, I'm a combat veteran, and a lot of the stories that are worth telling are the things that happen when we're not getting shot at, you know, getting yeah. through the day, trying to understand something or just, what's that? You know, mm. oh, it's nothing. It's just people walking walking by. Yeah. Okay, are you sure? And then you, you just don't know. There's so much of that intrigue that happens, mm. and we just don't have those histories. I mean, sure, there's some journals and that kind of thing out there, but for the most part, you know, the, the people in Rome, the people in the Roman legions, you know, they didn't get to write a lot of memoirs and biographies back then. Well, they wrote them. It's just they haven't survived. Um, you know, we've, we've got a tiny, tiny fraction of 1% of the literature of the ancient world. And when you think, you know, the, the story that started all this, this series of novels off, is based on writing tablets from Vindolanda, where you have these letters written. And as, as many people point out, it's the sort of stuff that comes across any commanding officer's desk or any manager's desk every day. It's the dull stuff. It's not... Yeah the dramatic events, the famous battles, it's all, can I go on leave? Where's this unit? How many people are where? What are they doing? How many are on sick call? All the, you know, normal stuff. And then people writing to their friends or buying things. Um, so you get these glimpses of what was there. And you know these people had very rich lives. And if you're in the Roman army, you were, you were signed up for 25 years. The odds are you did a lot of waiting around like any soldier. But there are aspects where there's a duty roster from a legion in Egypt in the first century that you could put up in a barrack room today. And it's basically the fatigues listed for that century of what you're doing over the next month. And it's, it's presented in a way that's familiar. It's, it's, it's not so very different. You know, you can imagine these guys moaning at it and looking and sort of saying, oh, yeah. It's, uh... It really is. It always comes down to logistics. You know, you get sent off as a Roman, as a commander, you know, uh, the further out you are, probably the less experienced you are. You have to prove yourself. So they're going to put you in a situation where there's not a lot of resources. And the God's honest truth is, is if a thousand dedicated people come to your position with the intent of overtaking it and killing you, you're dead. <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> that isn't different in Afghanistan. That wasn't different in Rome or, or wherever yeah. part of the outlying area. And 
there might be the other 99% of the army is somewhere quite safe at that same time because the luck was with them or with you. And it, it's that, you know, you look at these frontier systems and all these forts, and a lot of it was probably incredibly dull and quiet most of the time. And then now and again, something happens. And as you say, it's you can only send a message as fast as somebody can gallop a horse and carry it. And then people can only come to support you by the time they've got organized, by the time they've got sorted out, it's all quite slow. You know, this, this even comparatively short distances, as we would see them, you're a long way from help. You're a long way from any support. So it's trying to give that sense of isolation. But also, you could walk into a base in Dacia, which is Monday, Romania, one in northern Britain, Roman army base, and there'd be enough that would be very familiar. Right. You'd look around. The way things were laid out, the way things were organized, apart from the structure of everything. So it's it's sort of one big army, but it's it's spanning this incredibly large empire with very different climates, cultures, all the things you're doing. Um, and yet there is a link. There's sort of, you know, there is some control there. But on the other hand, when it comes down to it, you might be the one who's out there um, where, yeah. you know, um, it's all happening. So... Uh, there's a lot that goes into that. I mean, if you're a lieutenant, and, and I'll just use modern times because it's shocking how often we look at something from Roman times or even Sumerian time, and you're like, that's the exact yeah. same thing. Like, really yeah. not much different at all. We mm -hmm. think we know history, and I want to get into this later on, like what mm -hmm. we think we know of Roman history, et cetera, and how we mm -hmm. apply it in modern times. You know, it's paper thin, like, like all things like mm -hmm. that are like this. But um, if you take a platoon, which is – for the sake of argument, let's say that's 50 people that are out there trying to survive yeah. on the side of a mountain in mm -hmm. Afghanistan. And you walk a, a patrol, which is less than a platoon, mm -hmm. and you walk them out two miles away, they're mm -hmm. 45 minutes into the future. And so whatever yeah. comes and hits them, there is no help mm -hmm. coming for at least yeah. 45 minutes. And when that help gets there, it can't be so breathless that it can't yeah, engage. Exactly. Yeah, you know, and so okay, maybe maybe a helicopter is there, but probably not. That's because mm. you're way the heck out. So it's called economy of force, yeah. mm. and so you're forced as a lieutenant, as a very junior commander, to be a political animal early on because you have mm. to work with this community to survive, and you can't you can't let ego and your your ability to impose will cause you to to not to die you know, because it's it's dangerous and that has always been true for these guys in these outlying case uh, forts and the decisions made by somebody who's you know not getting paid a lot really by the standards of the whole army make a huge difference in your relations to the local peoples because as far as they're concerned you are the roman empire or you know you were the british empire on the northwest frontier of india um hundred years ago and more recently you're nato you're the u.s army there there, there isn't there isn't anyone else. And it, it's that I've tried to, I've always seen these, particularly the, the Vindolanda stories that came up as, in a sense, almost as Westerns, but they're very much frontier stories. They are that on the edge. They're where, yes, you're technically part of the Roman Empire, but um, what does that really mean? And right. try to suggest that, you again, you've got these very mixed, you know, the army is recruited from half the population of the empire, and most of them are not Roman as we would understand it. And even if you are Roman, you might never have seen Rome or Italy. You might just, you know, it might just be your status. So you put all these people together and then you send them out and then someone, and it can, you know, you've only got to look at some of the, um, some incidents say with the, um, the Plains Indians in the, or Plains tribes in the, the 19th century, how sometimes you get the last person you would want is the one on the spot doing the negotiation oh. <laughs> and everybody else has to carry the can for that. But that's, yeah. That's how it plays yeah. out, that's who's there. Um, and sometimes you get the right person as well who can make things happen in a way that's completely different. You just uh, So much depends on that personality and that character. And yet we're dominoes? looking at this as great. Yeah, big pun. Do you play dominoes? Not for a long time. Used to, but... Um, but it, it reminds, so here's the thing that mm. happens, um, and I know this has to happen. So you, you go out there mm. and you're doing your tour in mm. wherever you're at, you know, uh, mm. Romania. By yeah. the way, I used to know a Romanian colonel named Colonel mm. Roman. So he was Roman the Romanian. <laughs> Easy to remember. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, he looked very Roman, by the way. <laughs> well, they do. They're, they're proud of the fact they're descended from the Romans, as far as they're concerned. Yeah. Whether, whether it's true or not, maybe. But, uh, Who knows? but Romanian is a Latin language. You know, it's, it's, right. the, it's there right. in the middle of Europe where all the others around it are not. And they're suddenly they're speaking this. So it's, yeah. So 
when you're there and you do your tour out at that fort, at some point you leave and then whatever mistakes you took, they leave with you in your perception. But the reality is the next commander is holding that, that can that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And so those, those offenses are still given and you don't mm -hmm. even know they exist. And I've seen this mm -hmm. a lot with commanders who come in, but they don't realize that there's this thorn in their side that their peer did. And their peer would never know that they did it either because mm -hmm. It's so hard to work cross culturally, cross language mm. in an area where you know you're trying to you're trying to do something, they're trying to do something, and those things mm. don't always jive. You know, that's like yeah, uh, we, and so you can do a lot of damage to your own well being or just create discontent. Mm. And and again, you're so exposed out in these forts, outlying areas, mm. you want to sow contentment, but not so much that you're not doing your job. It's a real yeah. it's a real tough balance. Mm. It's um, and particularly when they're an oral culture, even things that happened generations ago, they were what my grandfather told me. So the person remembers it as a very perhaps a more immediate thing than we do sometimes when you've read it in a book or a newspaper. You know, so th these old arguments basically can, can still live on, and, and and it's and you don't know, and that's it's. I mean, one thing the Romans did; they tended, as far as we can tell, and there are lots of problems you get the impression a lot of people stayed for quite a long time in a region. So could develop that, but that can be both good and bad because obviously if they get to dislike you, then that's sticking as well. But on the other hand, you have a chance, or at least some people can, but if you can be bothered and not everybody is willing to try and learn how things work and see it from the other point of view, and but not go native in a sense and not turn around completely, as you say, still do your job. But understand yeah. it. Try and do it in a way that's going to work there rather than how on paper does, somewhere else. How does that work, though? I mean, I, I know in the mm -hmm. American Army, we struggle with the cultural thing. Uh, the moment you go native, someone else decides it for you. You know, I'm really mm -hmm. good at going native and, and getting in mm -hmm. and building trust. Mm -hmm. But I'm also understand that I have to constantly and I look at everything like an equation, right? Like mm -hmm. if the American side is too dominant then this side will recede and you can't, it's harder to line them up. Right. So I'm always mm. trying to teach commanders to balance things out and mm. to reduce their dominance. And I have to do that by going partly native, but I also have to go native with the American side mm. and make, and make the other reality at least palatable, uh, possibly yeah. understandable, you know? Mm. So what are the, what are the Roman, what do the Romans do to teach their people how to do this? It's, I mean, the, the Romans are quite good at it, but then they do have a lot of practice. It's, one of the things, I, before I started writing these novels, I read a non-fiction book called Pax Romana that was trying to look at just what does it mean when the Roman Empire arrives and how to react. And the striking thing is, which again you see parallels in the modern world, is that everywhere you arrive, there's already history, a lot of competition. There's the local culture. You've got local leaders, many of whom are vying with each other for dominance, different groups that are trying to dominate. And there's nearly always someone who sees you the new arrival as an opportunity. They're big, they're strong. If I get them on my side, it'll help my cause. And there are others who, as soon as someone's done that, well, because my enemy has done that, I need now to find somebody else to match the Roman. And, you know, there are some areas of the Roman Empire where the Romans arrive and they conquer and no one ever fights them because they've decided it's actually better to be friends to the Romans. And on the whole, Roman rule is quite sort of laid back. They don't want much from the provinces. I mean, they'll tax you, but um, and there are cases where it goes horribly wrong. But there's a there's a sense because at the highest level, you know, the Roman commanders, the senatorial class that are commanding the provinces, commanding the legions, they're only ever in a post for a couple of years at most, and then right. they go off to another career that might be a civilian post. It's much harder to tell how many of the people are there longer. There's um, the character Ferox, who's the sort of the main hero right. of the story is I have him in the early books. He's a Centurio Regionarius, the regional Centurion. And we hear a bit about these guys in that they crop up, people list as a title, they're mentioned at Vindolanda, they crop up in Britain, they crop up in Egypt. So we suspect it's fairly universal. And we hear in some sources that they're sitting in on meetings of tribal councils. You know, when the chiefs gather or when there's a festival, they're there, they're sitting, they're talking. And you get the impression they're trying to build up. So there's a sort of political diplomatic aspect to it but they're also the roman authority as well so people you know they know that that's what they see when anyone's looking at them so while they might be trusted there's also the element of what do i want the romans to do or not to do the problem always is is that getting down to that level 
in the Roman period, you have glimpses of it. You know, you get little hints, this is what's going on. But no one at that level's written a, an account that has survived telling us about mm. it. So the novels are really an attempt for me to try and think of how it might have been. And inevitably, I've drawn on other periods that, that we know more about. Um, sure. And just the sense of trying to create a world that could have been real. And I, I can't guarantee 100% or anything like that, that this is what it was really like. But something that's workable, some sort of sense. And even in you know the other books that... As far as the Romans are concerned, you know, they talk about the Britons. All the people on this island are the same. But that, as far as we can tell, is not the way anyone local would think, because you belong to your tribe, to your clan, to your particular family, down to these different groups. And the concept of being a Briton or a Gaul is completely alien to you. And you might, after a few generations of Roman rule, you might start to think that way. But trying to suggest that, and very clearly, a lot of Roman senior officers are not going to be able to understand this. You know, many it's quite rare for them to learn a language other than Greek. There are a few exceptions of men who learn the local language, but you sort of feel lower down, people have got to be doing this. But again, it's, it's, it's the hints and the guesses rather than, I may have made my Romans a bit too nice, a bit too modern in some respects, but I've tried to hint that now and again, there, there is the going into a village, burning it down and enslaving the population. And this, that, that's how the Roman Empire works. Yeah, but yeah. they were very practical. So they didn't, you know, they don't want a rebellion. They don't want, it's expensive. No government wants to spend money and station these troops there. And yet Northern Britain, say, has a wildly disproportionate number of soldiers in it over centuries. And that's always a problem for the Romans because not only is it expensive, but when you've got people who might decide to make themselves emperor, you don't want to present them with a large concentration of soldiers who might think, yeah, that's a good idea, and back them. So it's dangerous in a way that isn't really true today. So there's something going on, but the, the literary sources we have, you know, we have something like six, seven mentions of Hadrian's Wall. That's it. And none of them really tell us anything about it or what it was for. So, you you know, archaeology will tell you about the long-term trends, the patterns, what they're building, some idea. But, you know, you sometimes you'll find a Roman little fortlet or a tower with a stockade around it next to a little village or a farm. And what you can't get at is, is this like the police station that actually reassures you and makes you feel safe? Or are, is this the hostile force that's you know, staring down your throat all the time and you resent? Because the archaeologist isn't going to tell you that. All you can see is that these people are living cheek by jowl for a long time. But we just don't know. It's the lack of knowledge on these things, it is incredible. And I think you're doing right by looking at current things. Because when I was reading the book, uh, and again, a lot of parallels between, in particular, Afghanistan, mm. just because you can be so remote and you are trying to work with the local villagers. And sometimes, and sometimes to survive, you have to put a whooping on somebody so that everybody knows that, like, no, these guys aren't messing around. You know, as long as we're nice, we'll all get mm. along okay, which... Is an atrocity, but then again, it's just trying to prevent a different atrocity. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it's uh, interesting. So a guy like Ferex, who mm -hmm. uh, travels around in this, um, you know, in, in your story, mm -hmm. like he's in Britain and mm -hmm. now he's over in Romania. What does a dude like that, like when you get your orders to go, mm -hmm. I don't know, what is that, a thousand miles away? To a whole oh, new yeah. world, whole new land. Yeah, like what is that like for someone like that in that day? Or can you even guess it, it's, it is down to guessing because we see, you know, we often, much of the information we have about centurions of officers of that grade comes from when they've set up an inscription recording their career. And it's often a tombstone or a monument set up by the family and it lists. And some people, you know, there are men who served in 12, 13 legions dotted all around the empire. Now, we can't be 100 percent sure that they physically go to those places. And this isn't just a jump in rank or status. But that you're actually, because we know a lot of officers are detached. They're at headquarters. They're um, doing all sorts of jobs. You know, you get one fellow who's in um, Byzantium controlling the traffic and regulating things through that. There's one Vindolanda tablet has a strength report of a, an auxiliary cohort. And out of the six centurions, only one is at the base. Two are within a day or so's journey. But the other three are in the south of the province. Um, so someone has had to step up from the grade below to do their job, presumably, but also, so it, it's, there's so many things that the Romans knew without having to explain. 
So they never bothered to quite explain to us at, at any point. I mean, it was interesting. A, a couple of um, summers ago, before all um, the coronavirus was out, I took a few historians of the Napoleonic era, who were both one ex-Royal Navy, one ex-US Army, around Kylian, a Roman army fortress where there's, there's remains not far from where I live with, um, you know, you've got an amphitheater, you've got barrack blocks. And they're both specialists on the Duke of Wellington's army in that era. And they said there's so much they don't know because nobody ever wrote it down. That just the way particular regiments did things, the way the army organized things, every now and again, something turns up and thinks, oh, shows that they're doing that. Now, it was a perfectly logical thing to do, but often you assume it hasn't happened that early. Um, or we're being too modern, you know, we're just assuming they're basically a 21st century army, even though they're not. So at least with that society of 200 years ago, we've got far more connection to jump back 2000 years and then think of not just what's the logical way we would do something like that, because mostly, you know, they're practical problems very often. But how would the Romans in Roman society? You know, we know that the next grade up, the equestrians, the sort of the social class below the Senate who provide a lot of officers they seem to move around. Our guess is they do about three years in a job. Um, the Vindolanda tablet showed us that at a base like that, the commander comes along, but he also brings his family. And that's wife, yeah. children, slaves, freedmen, hunting dogs, horses, because basically the house he occupies that's built for him in this, although it's built of timber, you know, it's a decent sized house in Pompeii. And it's there in this base. And later on, you know, it's, it's even though this is northern Britain, they'll build it around a central courtyard to keep the hot sun off you, you know, which Northern Britain isn't a problem that often. Um, so you, all these people are sort of, you know, traveling around. The whole family's got to do They've got to put everything in the carts. They've got to travel in, in carriages. Um, so it's happening. But apart from a glimpse, there's a, a marvelous letter from Egypt where a centurion writes to his wife and basically gives a long list of things she's got to bring him. And one of it's, you know, his his spare shield and all this. So, so you know, you have this image of this poor woman sort of laden down with a great heap of, of baggage on her head, but it's probably the woman and the, the slaves. But one of the warnings is when you're on the, the ferry boat, don't don't show off your jewelry. You know, it's not safe. There's a, so even some of these, the army doesn't really take much formal responsibility for even officers' wives. And the soldiers are, by law, not supposed to marry, but they clearly do. And some of them probably have more of their, their family with them. Because, again, they're in the army 25 years. And the army winks at this because any of the boys that come from these, these liaisons tend to be good material potential recruits. So a lot of people are born in castries, they're listed as, in the camp. And they tend to do quite well because, you know, they grow up knowing the system. So um, it's one of those. But basically, the state is saying, I'm not going to pay for you. I'm not going to organize your transport. I'm not going to give you a pension. I'm not going to pay, give you rations. Your husband can take all of this out of his salary if he wants to, and we won't stop him. But that's that's how it is. It's one of those sort of penny pinching things at the top. When you look at that part of it, the the pension and the how about the years? I mean, how young are you when you first enter and doing 25 years of service? I mean, that's a career. And if you start when you're 20, when you're 45, of course, people lived to be 37 back then. Yeah. So how long of a career is this? When does it start? And then when you retire after 25 years, is it retired or are you on to the next thing? Well, it's it's supposed to be 20 years of sort of full service, then five years as a, as a veteran where you're not obliged to do fatigues, you're exempted a few other things. But um, it's again, things don't always work that way. And, and part of the idea in the book is that when you formed a legion, by the time you were about 20 odd years into its formation, you'd have a lot of people who were all coming to that stage far more than you normally would from normal recruitment. And there's, there's, there's a few sort of hints of this, that there were these blips where, so what do you do with them? Um, and there are complaints earlier on of people not getting their discharge because there was always an excuse. Well, sorry, the war's still on. You know, we need you. Um, there was also in the small print, many legions seem only to have discharged every other year. So some poor blokes had to do 26 years instead of 25 because they joined at the wrong moment. But you're supposed to be 18. There are clearly some joining younger. Um, there are some joining considerably older. And again, that's the pattern. Some, some centurions stay on well into middle age. Um, but what they're doing, harder to say. Um, so it's... It's a mixture. It's probably a more 
mature army in a sense than than we're used to. You don't have quite so much quite such a turnover of your you know your average rifle section or rifle squad that's basically eighteen year olds, nineteen year olds, that sort of thing. But there there will be there, and it, it'll it depends that there's more of that spread, and it is um one of those those situations where it's quite notable on Trajan's column, which is the big monument celebrating these conflicts. When you you represent the ideal legionary, he's a sort of thick set bearded guy. So it isn't the dashing young warrior. It's the idea of this sort of maturity and strength. Again, you know, you look at a lot of those 19th century pictures of whether it's British Army or US Army, and they've all got these great beards out here. But there's that sense of sort of age, strength, maturity, rather than perhaps um youthfulness that we, we'd associate now. Um, and clearly a lot of people will go through, you know, one of the things that's hard to estimate is just how many are coming in who are literate. Um, the army runs on paperwork. It just, you know, it's, it, it produces, it records everything. It duplicates, triplicates, even um, you get four copies sometimes. Of the, and these are files that are clearly being used. So um, all of that's there archaeologically. And a lot of people we know, you know, there's a, a letter from Egypt where recruits just joined and he's got a, a clerk's job straight away. So he's saying, you know, while my, my mates are out breaking rocks in the quarry, I'm sitting in the nice, comfortable studio. So, but there's a little bit of evidence, which I, I've gone with in some of the stories, suggesting the army's actually teaching people to read. Because presumably, particularly from some of the provinces where there's no tradition of literacy at all, then they're not going to come. But it, it's so you've got to you need enough people to do this. You presumably got to train them. So um Again, it comes back all the time. There's this deep frustration. There's so little written by ordinary soldiers. It's just fragments, odd letters, odd incidents, stories about them, but stories told by people of senatorial class or, or you know, close to it, who clearly aren't going to quite understand this and who have are often a little bit suspicious and hostile to the, you know, the, the, the ordinary soldier as someone who has to be kept under tight discipline, you know, otherwise he's, he's causing trouble and all this sort of thing. I'm sure people at if all the different grades would see it differently. Um, but we're guessing, I think, I mean, I don't think human nature has changed very much no. over the, the <laughs> millennia. So, so I think that basically when you see the glimpses of that looks just like today, it probably was, um, but you can't prove it. When you think about things that look like today, mm. we have some advantages in that we don't have to do things in triplicate or quadruplicate, or if we do, it's automatic. Yeah. When you get paid, it goes directly into your bank account. You can access it anywhere. Mm. It's all virtual money for the most part. But in this case, these guys have to have money. And then from my experience, the, when you're deployed, the military doesn't want you spending all of your money in town. Some, sure, but you don't want to tear up the local economy with all of this, you know, gold and, and then devalue it. And then, oh my gosh, you have problems like crazy. So how did they deal with problems like that? And how does someone, as you amass wealth, I mean, it's in your sock. I mean, mm. I, I didn't try and I had a giant sock full of ca uh, cash and coins, right? It was probably yeah. $700 in there, you know? <laughs> and that's easy to do. And I wasn't even getting paid in, I was getting paid in, you know, electronic money and it would convert into script and coins no matter what I did. So what did those guys do about these kind of, you know, 25 years? They're like, hey, I'm going to bring all of my money with me <laughs> on this trail, you know? Well, it is. The army does have its banking system and okay. every fort has, unless it's in a really waterlogged area, underneath the, the shrine of the standards in the headquarters building, there's an underground strong room because you're physically storing a lot of coin. But the 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 signifer the standard bearer in every century is the man also responsible for keeping the pay records so you are supposed to be paid by the time of the stories four times a year and um it's all documented and a lot of it you know you're supposedly paid 75 denarii every quarter but then you've got deductions for uniform for food for equipment for all the, there's a long list the burial club all these sorts of things we've got some of these so in theory, they actually, one of the emperors stops two legions from ever camping together because he was a bit worried that their treasuries would be, have enough money concentrated there to allow the local governor to make a bid for the imperial throne. You know, there's enough cash to start you going. So a lot of it is physically there. And you notice very quickly when an army, when the, any army unit stops for even a few days, people are outside the camp to sell them things. 
And there are lots of traders who follow them around. And there's one case of Caesar mentions in Gaul that um, one of his camps in the, the Belgic um, tribal areas is attacked and there wasn't even time for the merchants to get inside. Um, so they're there in, you know, a really dodgy area um, yeah. right from the start. And you can see it as well. One of the ways you can trace it archaeologically, you can see all the, the sherds from the pottery, the wine that's coming in, mm. the sources that are coming in. Um, those are visible because pottery, you know, basically it breaks, but it, it stays there. Whereas there. Yeah. the wooden yeah. barrels generally have, have rotted away. We sometimes see that a lot of the other stuff that's come in other containers. So the army is a, it's, it's the biggest group of people that's paid in hard cash in the Roman Empire. So it does have a big effect on the economy. But generally, the Romans actually see this as as positive in the sense that it encourages the towns in the area and the cities to develop into something that they see as more Roman. Mm. So particularly in the West, where maybe people haven't lived like that, suddenly along the Rhineland in Germany, because you've got all the, the army there, you'll have what will become cities like Cologne and, and um you know, others that have started as an army base, then the armies move on, then it's become a big civilian settlement. And it's, I mean, one of the, the there's a lot of Vindolanda tablets that are requests for leave passes. Yeah. We never know whether they've got them because we've only got the stubs of what they ask for. And they don't actually say, you know, is this a couple of days past to go to a slightly bigger town that's not too far away or a few days? Are you going for a few weeks to go to one of the bigger cities in southern Britain? Or is this a couple of months furlough? You can actually go back. Most of the troops stationed there are from what's now Holland. So do you go back home for a season? Um, because, again, you know, you are in the army a long time. So to, to keep keep up the goodwill and also because you want to you want to keep recruiting from these same communities, because there tend to be some areas in particular that provide an awful lot of soldiers generation after generation, sometimes even to the same unit. But just just generally, it's it's, um, you know, it's clearly joining the army is seen as a good thing, an honorable thing, or there's so little work there, you know, any of those factors. Um, so it's, you can move stuff on paper. So if you did get posted right to the other end of the empire, you didn't physically have to take a chest with all your money with you. But nevertheless, they carry quite a lot. Yeah. And there are lots of these coin hoards that have discovered somebody buried and never came back for, for whatever reason. Um, and there's sometimes you find a lot of newly minted stuff that's clearly just been issued as pay. Interesting. Yeah, I always wonder about the, the logistics of things. Just they, they fascinate me. By the way, we're talking to Adrian Goldsworthy. Here is his latest book. It's called The Fort. I've been reading it. And it's it's a, a whole big old dash of Roman history with some fiction thrown on top of it. And I love it. There are so many words in here that I'm like, I think these are English words, but they're English because they came to us from Latin. And uh, I, I was telling you off mic, I had to spend a lot of time in the dictionary. Because one of the things I do if I come across a word that I don't really have a command of, I might know it. Quote a finger, know it. But if I don't have a command of it, I look it up and boy, there are so many words in there. And it was, that might sound like it's hard work, everybody. It was a treat <laughs> to be able to read about these things and really understand what a centurion is, what a legion is, you know, all these different things. Um, and these areas, you know, Vindoland, whatever. What is that? I don't know what that is. Dacia, what, are, what is that? How do you even say it? Is it Dacia, Dacia, Dacia? I don't, you know, so there's a lot of richness in, in your books. And, and I, I appreciate you doing that. Because it uh, it makes the book just that much more engaging for me. It's almost like you've got a, a Wikipedia entry. Sorry for Wikipedia reference. But <laughs> underneath the book where you've got to go all these rabbit hole things. And it just gives you so much more depth and context. It's really incredible, man. Well, it's uh, you know I've spent my adult life studying the Romans. So I avoided writing fiction about the period for quite a while. Because I, I wrote some novels set in the Napoleonic Wars. Just because it was a break for me. I'm doing nonfiction yeah. history the rest of the year. And it was fun. It's always been a hobby. And you get that's just the time when you start getting lots of letters and diaries, even for people in soldiers in the ranks, let alone from from the officers. So you get those little stories. And most of the things in those books, when people would come and say, how on earth did you think of that? I'd actually say, well, that's from so and so's diary. You know, this is his lieutenant so and so of the 88th or um, and it really happened. Um, and they really did right. these things. And some of the the. the um, you don't get that with the Romans. You've got to imagine it in the main. So, and I'm still slightly worried. I'll invent something for one of the stories, and in 10 years' time, I'll forget I've invented it. So I'll be searching <laughs> through Tacitus and Suetonius, trying to find some reference to something that just seemed like a good idea when I was sitting there that morning. Yeah. Because it, it's yeah. filling in. You know, as a historian, I, I always try to be honest and say, there's lots we just don't know. You know, this is where we're right. guessing. This is what I think, but we don't know. 
in a novel, somebody can't just open a door, step into nothing. And, well, not right. this sort of novel anyway. <laughs> so yeah. you've got to try and see, well, how would it actually work? Um, you know, I'd never thought that much about what sort of horses the Roman army is using. Because most skeletal evidence, you can't tell if it's a, a stallion, a gelding, a mare. But just writing, when I had one of my characters a he, it was much easier if he could be riding a mare, because then I could say she for the horse, and just the pronouns are easier. And so I looked up, and then the, you know there were various views on this, and then someone had written, oh, no, the army just uses stallions. And you look at the size of a horse box, where three of these things are kept most of the time, and Putting three stallions in that space would not be a good idea for yeah. um, the yeah. health of these animals. So it, it's, you know, um, this is, it I makes, want to jump it in made me because, ask some questions I'd never have asked otherwise, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is true, mm. though, because, mm. again, Afghanistan, mm. we sent a bunch of Missouri draft mules out there because, mm. like, well, these guys need to have draft animals. Let's send, mm. Well, those mules ate entirely too much food. And mm. weren't built to withstand the altitude, 10,000 feet for these mm. low valley it didn't work. And then the funniest thing is, is the military, because the military, God bless us, we, we love to get things wrong. Um, they're like, well, the next generation will be more adapted. Like, these are mules. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, yes, that basic, it's um, it, it's surprising. I mean, I remember reading that on Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, the horses that survived the longest were the ones from Portugal, because yeah. they'd grown up half starved. So suddenly, they, <laughs> and not treated very well. So actually, this wasn't as bad as a shock to this big, right. you know, much larger, more impressive heavy cavalry horse were dying like flies because they just needed yeah. just more. Um, yeah. And it's that sort of, it's... Um, the practicality I, of what you have to have, what mm, works, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's Clydesdales and there's little tiny ponies. They all have things they do mm. well and not, and not do other well. The other, the other thing I was wondering about is... is you said they get to go home and, and do a season or two or whatever it's going to be to take a break. How fast does information move? Okay, yes, galloping horse. But, I mean, if you're in Britain and you were going to get orders from Rome and they're like, hey, we're going to send you. I mean, how long does it take to get that message? One Several way. Weeks. Even, you know? Several yeah, weeks, weeks to, for the journey. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's one of those interesting and really f irritating bits of, of the sort of sources we have. There's a letter from the orator Cicero written in 54 BC, where he talks about, I've just had a letter from my brother Quintus, who's with Julius Caesar in Britain. But moving on from that, he doesn't bother to tell you anything that's in the letter. But uh, Caesar was only in Britain for less than half a year. Right. And even at that, it's an expedition. He's come for the second time. He doesn't go back afterwards. And yet the army's messenger postal service is working well enough that this has got to Rome in less than a month, even then. So when things are more settled, when the roads are better, when the Imperial Post is organized, it's it's quick, but it's still, by modern standards, but, you know, our technology, there is no, there's not even a telegraph or anything. You know, right. you, you can send very basic signals from signal stations, but that, that's simple stuff. Anything complicated has to be written down or passed on verbally. So it is slow. And, you know, you have cases in the later empire where people will rebel on a false rumor that the emperor is dead. So the local governor declares himself emperor and then the news arrives, oops, sorry, he's not. So what do you do then? Because you can't really go back from that step. So you get hints of this. And um, I mean, Caesar talks about the, the, the peoples of Gaul yelling news to each other and always claims to be surprised at how fast information could, could, could be carried in some of these cultures. So very hard to tell, um, you know, it's, but it's 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 slower. You have to sort of think in a different time scale almost to how how long everything would take. The other thing I always think about it, and I, and you tell me because I don't know um, but how how often are we finding new things out? You know, finding a new archaeological site. Someone pulls an old chest of holy cow! I got these papers that are you know mm. these things happen right. You know, we go into a cave and there's something remarkable in that cave because a lot of the things we've written about. It had to have happened before, like the battle at uh, Lake Trasimene. Okay, that's a very famous battle. We've studied it. We all know the tax. But that came from somewhere. You know, maybe it came from Hannibal's genius, maybe. But mm. probably that happened somewhere else, and it's just not captured by history. Or maybe it was, and he learned it, and he said it. I don't know. But there have to be events that happen where they just haven't survived yet for history. Well, it's, it's one of the things that does survive for, you know, a Roman manuals for senior commanders is – Lots of examples. These are things that have worked in the past. This was a way of 
improving the morale of your men, of getting an advantage, getting a little edge in a battle. So they think very much in terms of if somebody did this before, maybe it'll work for me. Um, and that's, but that's also, that's partly a fluke of these things have survived. Other things haven't. Um, so there's an element, I mean, the new stuff, it's, you, you can't predict it. I mean, Vindolander is a remarkable site. They found another about 50 tablets, I think it was, to, to no, 2017. Um, and again, what you seem to have are largely the bits that when a particular commanding officer of the post is about to move on, he does a clean out and you, you look through the, what am I going to take with me? What goes on the cart? What goes on the bonfire? Because right. a lot of them have been partially burnt. They're wooden, thin bits of wood because that's cheaper than papyrus. Um, but it's so thin that as the fire heats up, you can end up lifting them off the fire and then they survive. One of them, that one of the lot they found in 2017 was in a row. And the speculation is that a man was carrying, say, a basket or a bucket full of these things with a hole in it. Right. And they just fell out and nobody could be bothered to pick them up. Yeah. Um, you need a site with the right conditions for things like that wood to survive. And, you know, Vindland is remarkable because I've, I've been there when um, they've pulled out a, a piece of leather tent, sort of, you know, a couple of feet square, and it's still supple. Wow. You know, this is calfskin, and that's dating that's to the early third century in that case. Right. Um, you know, so they pull these things out. They've, they've found more shoes there, leather shoes, than anywhere else in the empire. It's, I think it was over 5,000 the last time they counted it, to the point where I remember the head of excavations one day was there complaining because they'd found 80 shoes that morning, which you know, on most archaeological sites, that's the find of a lifetime. Yeah. But it's more of the, you know, where do we store these? How do we conserve them? <laughs> yeah. um, one of the interesting things with the shoes is that, you know, this is an army base. Yes, there are some expensive stuff that's owned by the commander, his wife, his, his family. But a lot of these, you can tell that unlike the Middle Ages, even an ordinary soldier's got several pairs. He's got service boots. He's got a sort of more lighter indoor pair. He's got slippers for the bathhouse. Um, you know, so at least three pairs at any one time, whereas, say, in the Middle Ages, you basically have your pair of boots and you wear them until they fall apart, then you get another set. So, it, And the other interesting thing is that over a period of maybe 10 years, fashions for both men and women in, sho in shoes change empire-wide. Wow. So they've got enough sense of what people are doing in Syria and Rome and Spain up there that even, and this is very much fringes of the, you know, this is really the, the northern edge of the Roman Empire, and yet it's still plugged into this bigger system. You can get almost any sort of good it's there. You might have to wait a bit, but it'll get there if you want it. So it's it's isolated in one way, but it's also weirdly connected to everything else as well. Relatively fast. I mean, it's again, it's not not the speed of the modern world, but it's compared to anything else that you'd had for a long time before, especially in Europe, and that you'd have in Europe again. It's going to take another more than a thousand years before you get back to that sort of society and that sort of economy, in some cases, not really to the 18th century. So, yeah. you know, there is something very different about the Roman period. Yeah. What is it about the Romans that, that we hold on to so dearly? They were so fascinated by Because, OK, look, we know a lot about the Greeks, but let's be honest, not that much. You know, like mm. person to person, uh, the Sumerians, nearly nothing. Mm. I couldn't mm. talk to you for one minute intelligently about <laughs> the Sumerians, the Persians, the Chinese, mm. the Chinese again. How about the Chinese after that? You know, all these different areas. And it's also interesting, too, when I, I think about, like, America, and, and we're such assholes to one another. You know, we talk about white people, and mm. we would want to lump, um, you know, you're white, I'm white, mm. a German guy's white, a Romanian mm. guy's white, a Greek guy's white, mm. all completely, dramatically different people with mm. different cultures, different beliefs. But it's really easy to lump them all together. Have we gotten any better at this, or have we always done this kind of thing where we just lump people together? I think we always have. The, the Roman genius, and it is unique, really, in history, is that they, they didn't just conquer an empire. They did make so much of that empire Roman. You know, and it, because it is strange. You know, the people at Vindolando, as I say, hardly any of them had ever been anywhere near Italy. Um, but they are Roman as far as – because even the ordinary, you know, the, the private soldier in an auxiliary unit, does his 25 years, he's made a Roman citizen. And he gets the full legal rights. Um, he might not have that much money, but this is, you know, this is status. And he's been in an environment where Latin is the, the, the language of command, of communication, where, yes, it's you can tell, you know, those with the linguistic skill can see um, there's an influence of some of the Celtic languages on the Latin they're writing and probably even more speaking there. But it's still very recognizably Latin. 
um, you know, the, it's it's almost the melting pot that you're exporting it. Whereas the, the, the great success of America more than anywhere else is to bring lots of people from different cultures and make them American. The Romans, unlike other empires, go out and they do that to people on the spot. And they have a long time to do it. I mean, Britain is one of the last provinces conquered and they're still here for 360 years. You know, is that so by the end of it, no one can really remember a time before Rome. And it's it's striking that when the empire does collapse in the fifth century, there aren't the sort of, you know, there isn't the winds of change that you had in 20th century Asia and Africa when the empires were swept away, that sense of, of wanting independence. It just isn't there. Nobody wants to be British or Spanish or, or a Gaul because they can't remember. Right. What they really want is a Roman empire that works for them and an emperor who looks after them and treats them well. And the empire isn't able to supply that anymore. It's been fighting itself for so long, it, it's just rotted away. But that's the dream. Civilization means Rome. And even the mm. groups like the Franks and the Goths coming in, they really just want a piece of the action. They'd like that lifestyle. Yes, we'll be in charge. Yes, we'll have the nice villas and we'll have the, you know, the luxuries. They're not trying to destroy it. And it collapses even though, in a sense, almost everybody wants to preserve it. But you haven't got the economic basis. You haven't got the stability anymore. Um, but it's it's existed so long that other than it's probably different in some Eastern cultures because they've been civilized when Italy was nothing. You know, there, there's right. a deeper sense and there are some. But even there, um, you know, there's a, it's quite hard to remember um, a sense of identity. So it's um, that success, I think, is part of it. It's also the Romans are this odd mixture in that they seem very modern. You know, they've got glass in the windows. They've got central heating in their houses. Um, and even though gladiatorial games, chariot racing, this sort of thing is rather shocking to us, the fact that Hollywood keeps coming back to it generation after generation, it's good box office. You know, people, yeah. you might, you know it's not real, but you're still watching these movies because it's exciting. But they're wealthy enough that they can devote all that effort and that money just to making their life more comfortable and entertainment. You know, the bathhouse is probably the most sophisticated piece of engineering the Romans produce to the extent where it's been quite hard when they've tried to reconstruct um, a bathhouse and get it working, actually to make it work. You know, what the, yeah. the one up at Wall's End on Hadrian's Wall, big problems with carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, presumably the Romans didn't all die every time they went to the bath. So there's something they knew, which we can't work out. Nobody wrote down, we can't work out from the archaeology or even from sort of first principles how you do this. And all of that, all that money, all those resources, it's just to make life more pleasant. So they're very modern in that sense, even though, you know, slavery is entirely natural to them. But it's different to the modern era is that it's never been for them a racial thing. Anybody can be a slave. Anybody can be a freedman. Anybody can be a Roman citizen. So they have all sorts of snobberies and prejudices. But oddly enough, appearance and race is less there. You know, it's still there. They're human. Um, it's more about, you know, the Greek idea. Everyone who is Greek is a barbarian. You know, they sound like sheep. Um, just bleating because they're, they're, you know, they can't talk properly, so they must be stupid. They must be inferior to us. So they have all sorts of prejudices of their own. And right. again, right. they're people. You know, you get rebellions against the Roman Empire, but an awful lot of the the violence that occurs is intercommunal. Um, yeah. It's where you decide. You know, Athens and Sparta riot and fight and kill each other in the second century AD. You know, this is hundreds and hundreds of years after the Peloponnesian War, you'd think it's almost like some of the you know, hooligans at a football match or something. Yeah. It becomes, it's so they still divide. You know, yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, Jews and Samaritans and these other groups where you get the rebellion against Nero and it's independent, but the first thing everybody does is turn on their neighbours. Yeah. Um, you know, the Romans are a bit too distant. We'll, we'll get to them later. But it's, <laughs> so it's, it, there's... Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, in a sense, th there is a truth to the, the Roman peace in that most of these areas are more stable. They're not by far from perfect. You've still got problems of banditry, crime, all these things. But at least sure. somebody's trying to control it yeah. and has a bit more chance of succeeding. Because not perhaps for any altruistic reason. It's simply they just want you quieter to pay your taxes and not cause trouble. Um, but to achieve that, then they sense, well, we'd better do something about it. I'm always curious about this aspect too of modern times and, and looking back at history as, as a mirror or a lens, I guess. You know, 
we um, again with when it comes to race because we're, like, we're so bad at this stuff, at least here in America. But we want to deny someone to be from where they're from. So I live in California. It's all Indian land. But before that, it was some other Indian's land. And before that, before that, before that. So it's always we've always throughout the world's history, we've always taken over land. And then at some point you come from there. If I was to say, hey, Adrian and I are Caucasian, mm-hmm. we're going to go to the Caucasus area and go get our <laughs> birthright, they would laugh at us. We're not yeah. from here. You're not Georgian. Mm-hmm. You're not Azerbaijani. You, you know, you guys mm-hmm. are from Great Britain and and, mm-hmm. uh, and the United States. Come on, get out of here. So you have to belong to somewhere. Mm-hmm. How how did the Romans or did they do a good job? I mean, I know the Greeks handled it a little bit different. Alexander handled it a little differently. But how do you, as a major society, allow people to belong to where they're from without it's, stomping on somebody else's, you know, fromness. I mean, it's, it's, it's the ancient world. So I'm sure, you know, there's, there's lots that's wrong about it. And there's lots of people resenting the new people who've been here only 200 years or whatever right. it might be. Right. Um, as you get today, the difference is this concept of citizenship. It is very different. I mean, I've tried to, it's one of the things I play around with in the stories and that I have Ferox who's right. because I live in South Wales, the tribe that was here was the Silures who fought the Romans for about 20 odd years, inflicted some serious defeats on them. You know, it's, it's hilly country. It's not mountains, but it's, it's rugged. Um, and they were clearly awkward, but eventually there's, they are um, suppressed. They give in. And the idea is he as a boy is sent to Rome. He's educated as a Roman given citizenship, which is what they did very often, and then sent into the army because it's partly a thought, well, he might be useful, but also there is this sense, you wherever you go, you try and recruit the people you were just fighting so that you can use them to fight someone else, but also you give them a job um, because in many of these areas where, you know, the ancient world isn't a peaceful place. So before you've got there, nearly everywhere has been fighting community against community for yeah. as long as everyone can remember it, probably longer. Um, you know, there is a reason people get buried with swords and things in Iron Age Britain. It isn't, it isn't just for show or because this is a show, you know, valuable weapon. Why they tend to build ramparts around even small settlements. Just, you know, it's, it's not going to stop a major attack, but it'll stop cattle rustlers or at least make their life more difficult. Um, so I've tried to play around with the idea of, of you've got this man who, in the one sense, thinks of himself as belonging to this tribe that's always been rather a predatory. You know, they were they were known to be raiding the neighboring tribes for a long time afterwards. And I've embellished on that. You know, basically, I've turned them into sort of Apaches, basically, because I grew up watching Westerns. I like Westerns. It's that sort of And it's, you can read about that. You get a sense of. So they're a cross between that and the sort of Patans of the Northwest Frontier, that it's, which doesn't quite work in this um topography here but it's near enough it gives them it makes them different the sense can i jump in here and say something too we just yeah. had sebastian younger on the show yesterday i don't know sebastian's work but mm. in his latest book called freedom he talks about the apaches and their ability mm. to move 70 miles in a day yeah you know and I, women children like if mm. you were going to be yeah. with these you had to move 40 miles mm. 50 miles mm. and nobody else in the region could do that because they were so well adapted to it their mm. life it, you know also was impacted by that. But this this is a real thing where mm. if you go follow that set of bandits around the wrong corner, mm. that that's called bandits kill you corner. So you know, yeah, they know that there's, you know, there's an ambush that can always because they know this yeah. land so well. They yeah. know how to move and survive. Mm. They are from there, truly. You mm. know? Sorry, I had to say that because it was no, no, no. Well, it struck that, me as important. Yeah, it, it well that's the idea. That's why I have him, you know, he's he's used to creeping around in the darkness, using the shadows and you know, even my modest sort of OTC stuff as a student. An awful lot of what we did was in the, it was night patrolling, all this sort of stuff. And you get, you learn a bit, not not much in the brief, you know, I mean, we were only students. We were sort of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that sense that this gives you an advantage. So he's fighting in a traditional way, but he's also a Roman. And he's not entirely happy about either side of it. I think people, scholars tend to be a little bit too simplistic. And there's been, it used to be, the idea was, you know, when, it was influenced still by from the early 20th century onwards when there there were still all the European empires and these were generally considered a good thing. So scholars thought the world, you know, the Romans made the whole world Roman and everybody was happy about it to the modern view where empires must automatically be bad. And therefore everyone's just pretending they're going through the motions. They don't really like it. They resent it. 
to the point where, you know, people are looking at pottery types and saying this shows active resistance against the Roman Empire. No, it's a dinner plate. You know, this is what you eat. <laughs> this is what you it's, – it's good for cooking. You use it that way. It's good, you know, these sorts of things. So some yeah. of it is is academics wanting to – they've already decided what the conclusions they, uh. they want, so they, they go and reach them. Um, I suspect it's complicated, but some of the interesting things are the Romans don't really care what you do at home as long as you do follow some of the rules. But there is this – you know, from early in Roman history – if you were a slave owned by a Roman and you were freed, you became a Roman citizen and your children had full rights. You had a few sort of limitations on what you could do. Not many, but a few. Yeah. They have absolutely everything. So, you know, even the Roman senators are saying by the late Republic and the early empire that, you know, look around this room. All of us are descended from slaves. And initially, the slaves you had were probably other Italians you'd been fighting. So they weren't so different. But as time goes on, you know, it does mean that people of all sorts of different shapes, colors, were Roman. Yeah. And once you got that status, then you were recognized as part of that. So, But again, you could have your private life where you have to wonder, you know, the, the aristocrats in Britain, for instance, don't seem to take to cities. The Romans want them to build a big house, live in the city, be a city magistrate, a city priest. The cities never quite grow here in the way they do in, in other parts of the empire, but they build these massive villas. So they do their own sort of version of Roman life. And there probably are still, you know, I've hinted in some of these stories you have in the fort, you've got the, um, you know, Ferox, his, his wife is the, the queen of the Brigantes. The Romans haven't quite recognized that a lot of these dynasties go on. A lot of these noble families go on. They're still the big landowners. They've managed to make the change. And in some cases, they're leaders of groups that allied with Rome from the start and saw they were onto a good thing or were the ones that did. So therefore they've ended up, um, Flavius Cerealis, who's a, a, a real character based on the Vindolanda tablets, we'd never have dreamed him up till these, these tablets came along. And from his name, you know, he's commanding a unit of Batavians. These are people from Holland. And in the aftermath of Nero's death, the big civil war that happens then, the Batavians rebel, first of all, saying they're supporting an emperor, and then they're going to make the empire of the Gauls. And it's a really serious rebellion because the, at the heart, you've got eight cohorts of some of your elite infantry of the Roman army who have this incredible reputation for fighting. And they've gone over completely officers, everywhere. so it's not just the men mutinied, everything there, they're still fighting as subtly as you are. And uh, um, Now, we always thought after that, the Batavians must have been, you know, the Romans must have thought it's too dangerous to let these people be commanded by their own nobles as officers. And yet the man who suppressed the rebellion was called Cerealis, and the emperor who won was Vespasian, who was a Flavia. So this man, or probably his father, has got the name Flavius Cerealis because they changed sides or backed the right side at the right moment. Right. And he's still commanding Batavians. And one of the one letter, a Decurion, a cavalry troop commander, refers to him as my king. Mm. So the answer is actually from the royal family of the tribe. So they are still keeping. So now it's. For, for a novelist, that's marvelous, and it, it's a big theme in some of the earlier stories. Um, but so yet the Romans are using some of these relationships. They don't mind as long as it doesn't conflict yeah. with you can yeah. still be prefect equestrian, you know, you're doing things the Roman way. But the odds are there's a lot more of this going on. There are people who, for part of their life, can go off and do things the traditional way. Um, you know, some groups it's one of the big problems with the the jewish population of the empire is because they've developed in after the maccabees these very strict rules about um what you can eat what you can right. do sacrifices you can perform you know there have been a lot of jewish mercenary soldiers in the earlier period under the persians under the the hellenistic kingdoms and again it was that sort of safety valve you took your young men who might think of banditry or rebelling if they can't get a job you send them off to the army, you, ed you educate them, you pay them, you make them Roman. And if they're going to go and do anything unpleasant, they'll go and do it to people you don't like rather than you. <laughs> yes. That's one of the reasons for the problem is that you can't do that with that population anymore right. because they won't join up. And they are formally exempted from service, which is seen as an honor, but it's also a bit of a problem. And for their aristocracy, one of the best ways, the, the sort of the local elites from Britain, from Gaul, from Spain, advance in the Roman system is volunteering to be army officers and being these equivalent because half the army of the auxiliaries, all of these units for the first couple of centuries are commanded by one of these equestrian officers. So you go through the stages where they sort of trust you, first of all, with an infantry unit, then maybe a mixed unit, 
you serve in the legions for a bit, then you get a cavalry unit. And you, if you get one of the really elite double strength ones, that's because you've been trusted because this is something you don't want messed up. And even even in terms of if there's not a war, if somebody doesn't look after the horses and doesn't manage that unit well, or at least allow the people who know what they're doing to keep doing what they're doing properly, then these are expensive assets that can go to ruin quite quickly. So it, it, there is this whole system, and the army is an important part of integrating people in to the point where, you know, by the second century, you're getting emperors like Trajan, whose family has lived in Spain for generations. And Hadrian as well, you'll get Septimius Severus from North Africa. But they're Roman. And it, you know, people might mock their provincial accent now and again, but basically it's it's very minor. You know, there, there, there is a sense that, but it doesn't last even with the Romans in that for a long time, if you're a Roman citizen, you can't be crucified, you can't be subject to lots of humiliating punishments. You can, you tend to get a better deal from the law mm. and you have more rights. Mm. Yeah. By the end of the second into the third century, they start dividing citizens up into the humiliores, the sort of more humble men, and the um, honestiores, the more honorable. And suddenly it starts that citizenship doesn't quite count as much as it used to. So your status goes, which means all these people who've served through the army and worked for it, their children and their descendants aren't getting quite the rights as before. And the empire is another of the reasons for this contribution, it becomes less stable. So, you know, right. human beings have an incredible talent for doing some really remarkable and gifted things, but they also have such a talent for messing up. But yeah. they, they each, might, you know, each culture might do it in its own way. But they, so the Romans, you know, they're not, it isn't coincidence that the Romans have this big empire for so long. They're getting a lot that, that, that is certainly, whether it's morally right or wrong, it's effective. It works. Right. Right. And most people are much happier being Roman and being in the empire than they are rebelling. But it's um, it doesn't you know it doesn't last forever. Nothing lasts forever. It's that sort of sense where bits of it start to decay and then it all falls apart eventually. But it takes a long time. It's so strong. So. Yeah, it is. And I think there's all kinds of remnants today. Uh, I wanted to ask: Is what's the neatest or most interesting thing about the Roman times that most people don't know? Like, what would you want to give us all? Like. This is something you couldn't imagine. Like, I know they did brain surgery. Okay, great. Mm. But like, what's something like that that just blows you away when you think about it? Oh, there's so much. And it, it's often, I mean, funnily enough, the, the things that often you, you find most pleasing as a historian, when you discover something and think, actually, that's pretty much as we do it today. You know, and there are, um, you know, you the one of the things, again, from Vindlander coming back to the, the shoe thing, they found shoes of the commanding officer's children. And it's just like any parent, you know, how quickly they're throwing these away because the kids have grown and you've yeah. got to get newer. It's those sort of ordinary little things that, that fascinate. But I mean, the thing that my, you know, apart from the fact we're, um, you know, next month's July after Julius Caesar, August after Augustus, we never really think of it. Yeah. But yeah. another thing that people never think about, we'll get to December. Now, December obviously means you don't need much Latin, 10th month. Yeah. But it's the 12th. Right. Because before Caesar in, uh, introduced the calendar, there were only 10 named months. And when he introduced it with 12, things still had to happen. The still had to start in January and had to finish in December. So you put two in in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> but when you move from a loop, and yet we're still doing this. And we don't, you know, we don't think about October, the 8th. But you, you, you never, it's yeah. so automatic. And there's a lot of Roman things that are still there beneath the way that we do things, the way we think, the language that, um, you know, even even for, for Britain or America, where we've got legal systems that aren't primarily based on Latin law, so much has still filtered yeah. in of yeah. the way we do things. So I, I, I think a friend put it best when we were with students studying this, is that, you know, the Romans weren't always nice, but studying them, they're never boring. Yeah. So there's loads yeah. of good stories. There's lots of things you just come back to and you read and think, wow, that's, it's still, it's still interesting, you know. That there's just that. So I, I think that may be rather than anything specific. Yeah. It's it's the, all these things, though, right? Like when we here in America, when when the president's like, "I'm going to nominate a czar of something," well, that's Caesar, mm -hmm. you know, and Kaiser yeah. is Caesar. Yeah. And, you know, it's just everywhere, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's incredible. I saw the uh, the, the the King Tut uh, exhibition. It was here in the states for a while, mm -hmm. and 
you can't invent a fork because somebody did that like a long time yeah. ago. Or the pen, they had a pen and a notepad mm. behind, like by, by his bed for like a dream journal or whatever, you know, mm. and who knows if it was his or not, but you know, it's Egyptian era. Like this is a, a notepad and a pen by a bed is, that's just a human experience. And you're right. So many of these things, they go across all time. It's, it's neat. And, and then, yeah, how about, um, not only if you, if you're going to name two months after two different, mm. um, you know, leaders of Rome, you're going to make them the longest months of the year, you know, <laughs> not going to, not going to shortchange one of them. And then how about the days of the week all being, you know, Greek or Roman, are they all, are they all Roman gods? The, the days no, the well, week? you've got Thor Thursday, you know, that's, uh-huh. that's, that's, that's so, um, and Tuesday, Friday, these, these are all so, and, and Woden's day, Wednesday, you know, yep. so it's, that's where the Anglo-Saxons have come in and given mm-hmm. us that. And we don't think about it. And it, it's, yeah, um, right. you know, I sort yeah. of always think when people get worked up about using, BCE instead of BC and all this sort of thing. I think, well, have you ever looked at the days of the week and thought about those? If you want to take offense, you will, but it's the yeah. same system. Why, you know, it, you don't need to be um, sacrificing things to Odin just by saying it's Wednesday today. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's just, um, it's, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to say one too, on our end, like when we start getting mad about things named or we hate Columbus and we yank statues down and I'm not defending Christopher Columbus, but mm. the capital of our nation, the full name, if you're going to say it is Washington mm. slave owner, DC yeah. or Christopher Columbus and mm. the United States of America, an Italian explorer. I mean, it's like, what are we going to do? Like you can't. You yeah, know, exactly. It's, it's, and as you say, you know, how, how far back do you take it? You know, it's, right. um, I'm living in Wales, you know, the, the, the word Welsh comes from the Anglo-Saxon word for foreigner. You know, these were the yeah. ancient Britons who get sort of pushed out and, and survive on, on the fringes. But, you know, it's it's a long time ago. And um, many of those peoples had come and had subdued other tribes. It's it's one of those things that sometimes, again, that there's a big problem within the academic community because this the natural reaction now, empires are terrible, the Romans are conquerors, therefore the Romans are terrible. But look at the people who were here before, because most of those are also empires, just the smaller. <laughs> yeah, They're less successful. The, the Romans are basically yeah. the biggest, toughest predator on the block and the most yeah. successful at building something afterwards. Not saying they're nice because they're not very often, yeah. but yeah. more people well, have a this- higher standard of living then than they did before and then they did for a long time afterwards. So, you know, it, it's um, history yeah. isn't simple and there aren't, you know, nobody is. There haven't been that many saints and absolute, utterly evil monsters in history that we can just categorize people accordingly, let alone yeah. groups. You know, you, you start start going down that pathway, and it, it's not a healthy one. Yeah, let folks be folks. Hey, everybody, go get The Fort, Adrian Goldsworthy's book. And any, actually, really, if you're into history, just go to his website, adriangoldsworthy.com. There's tons of great stuff there. Obviously, look, listen to the, the other guy talk all day long, and, and your big brain. I just love it, man. I love that we get the kind of just throw these conversations together. It means a lot to me. Anything in closing? No, no, I think, I mean, I, I've probably talked more history than I have about the novel this year, but it's always difficult. You don't want to give the plot away, but... Um, exactly. I, yeah. I write the, the sort book of novel is really I, good. I, I love to really read, so I think exciting. it's good. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, the, sorry, the one yeah. thing I'm proudest of is that I've, I don't like any of stories that are set and where you've got lots of military characters where nobody's got a sense of humor. So part of the idea in these and all the other books is that these people laugh. That You know, the humor might not be subtle. It might not be um, always that nice, but it's there yeah. because you're dealing with terrible situations and that's what people do. So I, as far as I'm concerned, and there are hints of it in the sources, the Romans were just like uh, people today. So that's... I'm very proud of my bad jokes in these stories, even if Yeah. No, it's they great. Make it's anyone else laugh, I, they make me smile. I have <laughs> laughed out loud, belly laugh during a firefight. So it happened. <laughs> it happened. All right, stand by.